why they're anti-membership?
Good morning, church. Come on in. I love to see new faces. Come on in. Come on in. Good morning, church. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. All right. There we go. This is a place we should be really cheerful to be in, right? Yes. We hear all the praise of the Lord, so we're going to do that with, with his word. We're going to do that with praise, praise song, where Catherine's going to start here in a little bit. We're going to do it with prayer. And this is why we gather together to give him praise. Amen? Amen. All right. Great. Catherine, could you lead us now as we praise God in One, eight. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth.
Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. <laughs> Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. That's from Psalm 36.5.
please be seated as we continue to worship. to continue our worship in the London Baptist Confession. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, this week we are focusing on chapter 17, paragraph 2, Perseverance of the Saints. And we will read together as a church, one body, Perseverance of the Saints does not depend on man's free, but on the unchanging love of God the Father. It is based on the efficiency and the intercession of Jesus Christ. You need in him the oath of God, the abundance of the Spirit, the seed of God within them, and the nature of the covenant of grace. This certainly in the infallible when their perseverance is based on all these things. And that comes from Romans 5, 9, and 10, where it says, Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Amen. Much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life his life amen we continue on with our announcements we have work day yesterday for those that are there thank you very much for being there it was quite a blessing to see everybody come together thank you all volunteers that were there uh, a lot was accomplished. I want to uh, thank Pastor Ben for organizing and putting it all together. Uh, spe special recognition to Don Heldor and his little tractor. Yeah. That got a lot of the work done. It's like, get out of the way. Let the tractor do the work. Uh, all that showed up on surprise, just to even pull weeds. It was really, truly a blessing. And uh, how we had some, even some past members come back. Uh, Larry Dunn showed up and sprayed the building. Uh, Pastor Ben's, uh, Pastor Ken's family was there. It was a wonderful event, and I want to thank you all for that, what was done. Uh, we want a beautiful place to worship God at, don't we? So, yeah, we come together, uh, and we give him praise, and, uh, and I want to thank uh, Todd uh, Anderson for all what he contributed and uh, all the the mulch that he brung and his skills and how to do it all. Thank you, brother. He's hiding back there. Can't get away. <laughs> Next, we have the book of the month. The book of the month here. Uh, pocket history of the church uh, available in the entryway here. If you're a reader, please pick it up. And then we also have a, a class come together, a gathering together. What an opportunity to go to the pastor's house. Don't ransack it or anything like that. <laughs> Don't take anything off the shelves. God's watching, right? But we're going to get gathered together November 5th. Please write that down. Very important. From 1 to 3 o'clock p.m., not a.m. Don't show up early. Don't be knocking on his door. Uh, and we can discuss the book then. What an opportunity we have. So please gather together and mark it on your calendar. Uh, do we have an address? Do we know where he lives? Who's up there? It's also in the program, okay? No excuses. We got it all set. Okay, also Life Choices is having an annual fun, uh, uh, fundraiser uh, coming up this October 21st. That's right around the corner, right? Friday? Good, thank you. Where is it at? Good question. <laughs> um, don't have that information here. Uh, I'm going to suggest that you see Elder uh, Brady over here. Lo Atlantis Hotel Casino. For any details, please see Phil. 
He'll be glad to fill you in on that event. Okay, so now it's time to let the kitties all go to the classrooms. You're all dismissed, kids. Enjoy your time learning about God. Oh, we have a hand raise in here. Missions? Okay, wonderful. Yes, Catherine, would you come up and pray for us about our missions team today? Uh, yeah, we usually do this the second Sunday of the month, but you know, it's been such a busy month. Uh, main thing is we want you to know what our missionaries are doing. And we want you to feel involved because they are doing some really exciting things. And you know, those of us who know, have known Ken for years, we really appreciate the creativity of his ministries. His musical ministry in Japan is so unique and so just God-driven, we believe, that we've been happy to support him for many years. Um, his recent letter is talk, telling us about a few other things going on. Um, he has uh, gathered with the Asian tw Asia 2020 Congress. It was a large, the first large gathering of Asians for Asia, Asians for Asia, evangelical organizations with the purpose to see a church and missions movement emerge from our unique Asian context. And this is, this is interesting because, you know, sometimes when you think of Asia, maybe you just think of China or you think of Japan, but a confluence of many nations in Asia with that unique perspective is really powerful. They, um, and then our project, I was, and I haven't seen a date on that, there were, uh, there were some other projects he's been working on. The Blessing Asia virtual video, um, he's very uh, skilled and gifted in that arena too. Uh, first Asians for Asia top professionals, artists, musicians, and dancers were performing this beautiful song, which I have a link to. And any of you, I can forward this newsletter from my email to anyone who would like to see this and follow the links and listen to the music that they've been making. Um, DTO stands for Dare, or Dare to Overcome Japan. Uh, the first conference of that nature was held in August, August 27th. Uh, they had four high caliber speakers, two from the US and two were Japanese. And their goals are to highlight global issues of interest to working people and teams to help companies and organizations. And second, to improve pr productivity and solve social issues by shedding light on global themes of interest to workers and teams in Japan. And then the topics were, were in the area of human trafficking, disabilities, uh, employee resource groups, and religious making the most of diversity in the business environment. So these are issues we see in our country and they're very much on their minds there too. Um, let's just say a word of prayer for Ken now and all that he's doing, he's, he's really impacting many groups and people throughout Asia. Lord, thank you for Ken Taylor and his unique and uh, proactive ministries that he's been involved with, with other Japanese, with other Asians. Lord, we just know that his impact will go forward and will win people for Christ. And we just ask you, Lord, to, to do that in their lives Give him encouragement. Let him see souls one to you. And continue to bring people to those groups, to the music groups and the other groups, business groups, that those who are longing for the Lord, those who don't even know the longing and come and find you. Lord, you are in control, and we just ask you to, to bless that ministry, continue to bless that ministry, and be with Ken as he is alone his children gone and his wife gone, Lord, that you would keep him encouraged and, and uh, blessing you and praising you and being the encouragement to others that he so much is. We pray all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Catherine, for bringing focus into our ministry with Ken Taylor over in Japan.
We have our board over here by the doorway that has our missions families all laid out for you. Uh, please feel free. We do support these ministries. So you, they are a part of our church. And, oh, nice picture. Okay. Um, <laughs> so now let's pray before we have our pastor come up and give us God's word. Dear Lord, we're thankful for this church that you have provided for us, Lord. Lord, we come on our knees to hear your word today, Lord. Lord, speak to us clear. Lord, give us the ears and the patience to listen as Pastor Ken speaks of you, Lord, through him. So, Lord, we're just thankful that we have you. Lord, give us the heart to hear you and bring it to our hearts, Lord, so that it dwells within us as we give you great thanks for your, your scriptures, Lord, your word here today. Uh, we pray this in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Ken. All right. Well, good morning, church. It is good to be with you all. I'm so uh, Delighted to be opening the word and delighted to be singing with you all. Um, you know, just think about what we've already sung. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Great is thy faithfulness. You and I, man, our faithfulness <laughs> to God is uh, always in question. It is always fluctuating. It's always here and there. But man, God's faithfulness is constant. It's like like a, a river flowing from the highest mountain that never runs dry. His faithfulness is indeed great. It's also great that this morning, I don't know if you felt it, but like there's this extra sense of the Holy Spirit in the room. Man, um, we, uh, we have among us Pastor Austin White and his lovely wife <laughs> visiting from Calvary Baptist Church. Thank you so much for taking your vacation Sunday to be with us and worship with us. We got the, de the delight of meeting them up at Tahoe for the pastor and wives gathering that happened about a month ago, right? Yeah. And uh, so that was the first time that Angela and I met them, and what a sweet couple. Um, Calvary is lucky to have you guys, or fortunate to have you guys, blessed to have you guys. Lucky is such a foolish word for us to use, but uh, um, go ahead, and if you have your Bibles, turn in them to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We will be Starting at verse 14, that's 2 Corinthians 6, 14. I don't know about you all, but um, throughout my life, after I became a Christian when I was 14 years old, there was a constant struggle of trying to figure out, okay, how do I now live as someone who has been called out by God, so in, someone who has been declared holy by him, someone who's been forgiven of their sins. And you know, it's, it's interesting, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, he doesn't just, you know, beam me up, Scotty, right? Like he, doesn't, he doesn't just teleport you to heaven and remove you from the messiness of this world, right? And so because of that, we're all constantly trying to figure out, okay, so then how then do I live as this person defined by Christ in a world that is defined by so much wickedness, so much opposition to the word of God, so much opposition to the kingly rule of, of Christ over everything, right? And today we're faced with a text that is all about this. Like, how do we do this thing of being in the world but not of the world? And that's not a direct quote from this text, but that is very much what this text is all about. And so, if you would, would you read with me? And we're, we like to stand in honor of God's word. So if you can stand, please join us as we read verses. We're going to read uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through chapter 7, verse 1. This is one of those times where, if you don't know, the chapters and verses were added to the Bible hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after the Bible was actually written. And so, I don't understand why they didn't just make every verse a sentence um, that seems like it would have been smart, um, and why they have certain breaks where there's just not a logical break. So we're going to go through verse, uh, se chapter 7, verse 1, because that's where the natural break happens. So starting at verse 14, 
The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? That's a fancy word for Satan. Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For, and that word for there connects us to the idea that everything he's just said about this is different from this, this is different from this, for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Go ahead and take a seat. Heavenly Father, I just ask you one last time before we really get going that you would anoint this time. God, I'm, I'm an insufficient, um, fallible man full of imperfections and, and full of just simple weakness because I'm not the creator. I'm not the infinite. I'm the finite. And so, God, anything that any of us are going to get out of this text, anything that any of us are going to get out of this time is entirely dependent on you. God, would you anoint this time? Would you open our eyes to see the text clearly, but also to see its implications on our lives? God, I find myself thinking of C.S. Lewis's famous words, it's, and, and I think somebody else said it as well, that it is not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand and do not obey that bother me. Lord, help us to see your word clearly and to obey. Such a simple thing to say. Such an incredibly hard thing to do, Lord. Our flesh is warring against this obedience all the time. The world and the devil, Belial, are, are waging war against this obedience every moment of every day. And so, God, would you please give us the strength to draw near to obedience, believing, Lord, that everything you've commanded is for our good and for your glory, and that we can delight in both. I thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. We know that you'll be faithful even in this, this time as we look upon your text. Pray this in your holy word, in your holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this is an interesting text in a number of ways. Partly because he's talking about being unequally yoked. Um, now, I have a little bit of history of bodybuilding. Dennis and I have enjoyed some conversations about our our history of, of bodybuilding. And, you know, we like to talk about being yoked and stuff, you know, right? Ethan's getting there, pretty yoked. Yeah. But uh, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about something else. This is imagery from the Old Testament. This is imagery from farming. Anybody here have a farming background? A few. Okay, a few. When I was in, in Kentucky, there were a lot more who had that farming background. But even even with your farming background, you probably had the use of more modern technology. Probably weren't dealing with as many yokes. But I want to show you what we're dealing with because y y it's important that we all grasp the imagery of what Paul is using here. This is a yoke. You put an animal on the left, you put an animal on the right, and it pulls the plow. And you plow your field, right? And there's some interesting um, text in scripture, let me read to you something that comes straight out of Deuteronomy 22. This is, now think about this, this is a command of God regarding how you plow your field. Like what a weird thing for God <laughs> to be commanding, but this is what God says. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, lest the whole yield be forfeited, the crop that you have sown and the yield in the vineyard. 
You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. Now you notice that God's doing something here, right? Is God chiefly concerned that, you know, having a bigger animal on the left and a smaller animal on the right, you're, you're going to have something like this. You're going to have a, you know, you're going to have lines that are a little squirrely, right? Like, like uh, a preschooler was, was running your plow and couldn't color inside the lines, right? Like, is, is that what God is chiefly concerned about? Uh, g- thank you, Mike. And Mike says no, probably not. And then here's a guy who got real creative. He, ha- he had a donkey and he had a camel, and uh, I'm sure that worked out for him real well. It actually, it looked like a pretty decent field. But, so is God's point, it is so important that you farm efficiently, right? Is God's chief concern that this just doesn't work? Kind of looks like it's sort of working. I don't know. It's clear. See, we, we have principles in the New Testament that tell us how to interpret the Old Testament. And so we have things quoted in the Old Testament, like when the Scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. And then the New Testament tells us, was that, was that written primarily because God is so worried about the ox? No, no, no. That is a principle to apply. And, and I'll just tell you, uh, Paul tells us that that text, in, in part is like why this church offers me and Austin's church offers him some kind of livable wage. Why do you do that? Because I'm the ox, right? Austin is the ox. Like we're, you know, and he's a lot more muscular than me. So like he, he's, he's a little closer, but um, we, we are the worker deserving of the wages, that, as Paul puts it. We are laboring for the kingdom, doing certain things throughout the week, that a volunteer just couldn't simply do because of the amount of time that it takes up. And so Paul says that these laws are not just written for the practical purposes of the Old Testament, but they are there for bigger purposes that pertain to mankind. And so we come to the text today, and Paul says this thing, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So in our text today, we are brought to to the point of evaluating pretty much all relationships before us. Pretty much all relationships in the you know in human contact. And so our first point, this is really the, the main point over the entire sermon. Everything else will kind of fall under this. That in every entanglement of life, and I've chosen that word pretty carefully, in every entanglement of life, we must remember that we have been set apart. And the implication is remember that you've been set apart and then live that way, right? But there's a lot of things that we could do with this text. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And there's a lot of ways that we can interpret even a statement like this. In every entanglement of life, remember that we've been set apart. And we could, we could approach this idea a lot like the Jews of the Old Testament, who, man, they were all over the place. You see, God has a long history with his people telling them, be holy, be holy. I've called you out. I've set you apart. Which, by the way, holiness is literally being set apart. And so kids in school that want to fit in are literally saying, I'm trying my best to not be holy think about that whatever circle you might travel in in work or school some of you are students in this room your pressure is more than than those of us who have grown up and we're in the workforce and we just don't care as much what our peers think about us quite the same as when we were in school when I was in school that pressure was a lot stronger to want to fit in but fitting in by nature by definition is basically the antithesis of Holiness, which is to stand out, to be set apart, to be different. And so, you know, I was thinking about this this morning, and I thought, there's a lot of individual challenges that the American church has. Um, But from a big picture standpoint, Scripture and all through our society, all around us, 
the number one problem with the American church is a problem of holiness. It is that we are not set apart and different from society. We are not set apart and different from culture. It's our number one problem. And you know what? It's been the number one problem with God's people forever. If you look back over the the pages of your Old Testament, what you'll see is God draw, he, he says, look, I'm going to make these promises. I'm going to bring you into a good land, a land flowing with milk and honey. But when you get to that promised land, realize that there are going to be people there who worship other gods. And so you better watch out how you interact, how you entangle yourself with them. Do not marry in with their families. This is not a a racist idea supporting, oh, well, you know, white people shouldn't marry black people. That's just a stupid application of this Old Testament principle. God was preserving their faith, not the the cleanliness of their bloodline and ethnicity. Does that make sense? So they come into the promised land, and what do they do? The very thing that God said, watch out! Don't do this. It will destroy you. And they intermarry with people of differing faiths. And it's not long before Israel is joining in the worship of Molech, which is the most disgusting worship in history, where they would come to a metal statue with its arms out, and they would put their live baby on the arms of Molech, and it would roll down into its belly where there was a fire, and they would burn their baby alive. That's in the Bible. Probably described in greater detail than what I just gave you. And I apologize for the PG-13. I didn't really give you a warning. (laughs) Um, It's in the Bible. There's a lot of other graphic things in the Bible. God was trying to protect them from the pollution of their worship, from the breach of holiness. And when they failed, God eventually brought Assyria and Babylon and carried them off into captivity. He said, I need to teach you a dramatic lesson he carries them off into captivity. God's very clear. I sent Babylon to go and get you. And so Israel kind of learned their lesson. Kind of. Because when they come back from their captivity and they return to the promised land and Nehemiah's rebuilding the wall and Ezra's leading the people in some sort of revival and there's a rebuilding of the temple and, this, and, and it leads into this whole second temple era because Babylon had destroyed Solomon's temple. Only now, when we get to the pages of the New Testament, the Jews have a new plan. Let's just have nothing to do with these people. We don't we don't eat with them, we don't talk to them, we just keep our distance. We it's like, you know, Jesus scripture says, be in the world, but not of the world. And unfortunately, first the Jews were of the world, getting all intertwined and entangled in wickedness. And the second time, they they refused to be in the world. And so how do you be a light to the nations when you cannot follow the instructions, be in the world, but not of it? It's not easy. Nobody's claiming that this is easy, but it is possible. Imperfect as we may be, it is possible. But I want to draw you into this this phrase, unequally yoked, because it's it's challenging. We have to unpack this a little bit. And I'm going to... Show you a Greek word. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing that. Here we go. So, this word would be pronounced heterozygeo. Heterozygeo. It's a compound of two words. Hetero, meaning like, like yes, you might be thinking heterosexual, right? Hetero means different. Zugaos, or zugas, is to pull a yoke. So, when Paul is saying, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, he is saying, now, now, let's back up a little bit and just ask ourselves, put yourself in the position of, the, of an unbeliever. And I'm, I'm not naive enough to think that there, there's no way there's an unbeliever in our, in our midst. Perhaps there's someone here who is still struggling with where your faith in Christ is. Still trying to figure out your relationship with him. Still, still trying to figure out, okay, if I died today... Am I confident that God would welcome me into the gates of glory, into his eternal presence? 
And the question naturally arises, am I so awful that you can have nothing to do with me? And the point is not that you are so awful. The point is not that the world is so, in, so much intensely more wicked than us, although there is some truth in that. But think about this with me. There is in every Christian a desire to go one way and to go another. One way in the path of, of God in su- complete surrender to him and the other in the path of their flesh and all of their own desires and ambitions pursue. There is on the part of the unbeliever who has refused to surrender to Jesus Christ, there is not the first desire. There is only one desire to follow their own ambition, their own desires, their own agenda for their life. So if you have two people coming together, let's just say marriage, because this this text is so often used in marriage, but it's so much more than that, and we'll get to that. But if you have in a marriage one person who is not the least bit committed to surrendering to Christ at every moment, they are set out for their own ambitions, their own desires, their, their own agenda for their life. And it may feel very noble at times, but it does not include utter surrender to King Jesus. And the other person, half of them, we might say, one part of them, the renewed man, desires to come under the conformity to Christ, to surrender to him. And the other part of us, every person in this room ought to be able to know what I'm talking about. If you are in Christ, there is still a part of you that is longing for your flesh, that is longing for your sinful desires, that is longing to do what you want to do, not in surrender to Jesus Christ. So this is just a way of thinking of it. 75% of that relationship wants to go toward wickedness. Okay? 25% of that that human relationship wants to go toward godliness. It's no surprise that more often than not, when a believer marries an unbeliever, it is the believer who winds up compromising more often than the unbeliever coming to surrender to Christ. This is the reality. And so, is this a relevant text for your dating? Is this a relevant text for your marriages? Absolutely. But, there's more to the story. So you see, when Paul talks about a yoke, why is it bad to yoke two people together who are on a different page, right? Hetero, different. Because one person wants to go one direction and another person wants to go a completely different direction. But they're yoked together now, and so there is constant strife, constant conflict, constant challenges between them. And I would just say to you pastorally, I have seen this over and over and over and over and over and over and over. That a Christian has been married to an unbeliever for whatever reason. Maybe they became a Christian after they got married, or maybe they made a poor decision entering into the marriage, or whatever the case. And in that situation, there is a tension as the two are pulling in different directions. And I have seen Christians just heartbroken over and over and over by that decision. Now, here's what I need you to hear. Because if we just take this this text, right? Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And so does that mean, Paul, does that mean that we just have nothing to do with people who are not believers? Well, no, let's put this into the context because this is, Paul's second letter, at least that we have in the Bible, to the Corinthian church, right? What has Paul said in the first letter that he wrote them? Well, in chapter 5, he said that one cannot simply leave the world or refuse to interact with the world. To do that, like, you're going to have interactions with the world. And, and so, in verse 5, he just acknowledges that simple fact. In, in, sorry, in chapter 5. In chapter 7, he deals with marriage. The Apostle Paul, while he's saying that a single person should not enter into marriage with a non-believer, he also says, if you find yourself in marriage, married to a non-believer, do not leave them. Paul is not saying, oh, you you, you found yourself, like you've come to Christ and your your spouse has not. 
He does not say divorce them. You ought to pray for them, love them, and encourage them toward the goodness of our Lord. And perhaps the Lord will indeed bring them to Christ. The Lord does not delight in divorce. In chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul deals with instructions for if you find yourself dining with an unbeliever. Okay, now think about that. Right? Paul assumes that you're going to have dinner in the home of an unbeliever. He assumes that in chapter 10. And so he gives instructions. Okay, when something is set before you, don't raise any you know, thoughts of conscience about what you're about to eat or whatever. If you find out that it's been sacrificed to idols, which we don't really have much of a modern application for, then he, he, just, he gives instructions because he assumes that you will have some social interactions with the world. So the point is not just get the heck out of Dodge and have nothing to do with these people, right? That's not the point. Otherwise, we could never be a light to the nations. So then we need some principles, some, some guidelines, some questions to ask in order to figure out how do we go about this relationship with the world that is meant to be set apart, is meant to be holy. How do we do this? And so I'm going to give you three questions that you can ask. If you're filling in the blanks, there's, there's three of these. And the first one is, is just to ask yourself, does the relationship have the potential to erode your own commitment to godliness? Does the relationship have the potential to erode your own commitment to godliness? As your pastor, I would say to you, if your closest, closest friend you have the most relational intimacy with are non-believers, um, there is a concern there. Because it is very likely that they will be able to say things and do things in your life that will pull your heart toward your flesh, what your flesh already longs for, what your flesh already desires. And I'll tell you what, Angela is my best friend. She's not just my wife. She is my best friend. We laugh together. She laughs at my jokes more than anybody else in the world, which is one of the reasons I love her, because I don't consider myself to have this great sense of humor. But she gets me, right? And I get her. And, like, we laugh at things with each other that just a lot of people just wouldn't laugh at. Um, my humor is a very goofy humor, and, and she, she gets it. She likes it, and, and I, I appreciate that. So the person that you're married to, it's a very close relationship. But there's other relationships in our lives that due to the intimacy of those relationships, they can erode your commitment to the Lord. I had a really hard breakup when I was 18. And Angela and I were dating. It was not with her. I had a best friend from church named Casey. And Casey, if you see this, you know I love you, man. I'm so glad that you're walking with the Lord the way you are now. Um, when, when we graduated from high school, Casey started going off the deep end. We were best friends. And we both had a tendency to have a temper. And Casey just started, he, he started giving in to that temper in some pretty extreme ways the ways that he was interacting with his girlfriend, getting into car accidents, things with his parents, you name it, just on and on and on. And, and I saw myself getting pulled with him into this, this part of my flesh that wanted to give in to anger and felt somewhat justified because, hey, I'm not as extreme as that guy, right? <laughs> like, there was a sense in which my closeness with Casey and seeing his volatile anger made me a bit numb to my own battle with anger. And through a conversation with a spiritual mentor, I came to the real realization that I needed to basically have a breakup with Casey. And we went to a donut shop. And I said, bro, I love you. Like, 
take a bullet for you kind of love. Like, I love you. And I want so badly for you to have a healthy relationship with Christ. But I see the direction that you're headed, and I see myself being pulled with you down. And until I see a change in you, I, I can't keep rolling with you. I can't keep being your wingman and, and you being mine. Like, I just can't do it, man. Because Christ is that important. And the, the closeness of our relationship is not allowing for Christ to have his place on his throne in my life. And I broke up with my best friend. And we reconciled years later after Casey's been through a massive amount of stuff. His life, man, it, it would make a movie. It would make a great movie. Um, crazy. So here's what I want to say to you is that, you know, I, I said that holiness is probably the biggest issue that we see in society uh, in the American church. It's the biggest failing of the American church all around us. Everywhere, every place, it's just, it's just so prevalent. But it doesn't primarily happen by the, the devil coming to Christians and coming to churches and saying, hey, what if you stop doing this God thing and you start doing something totally different? That's not how it works. The devil comes into homes. He comes to individuals. He comes to churches. And he says, you know how you're doing this Jesus thing, right? And you're doing this Bible thing. What if you mix in a little bit of this? What if you mix in a little bit of, you know, mysticism? What if you mix in a little bit of, you know, exaltation of self through prosperity gospel? Or what if you mix in a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit, a little, little bit of self-esteem movement, you know, just exaltation of self? What, what if you mix in, and this is what Satan does. And the illustration that I have used a hundred times is if I were to hand you a glass of water, Right? I just poured it straight out of an Alhambra bottle, right? Pure water. How many drops of poison do I need to put in that glass before it's effective? Right? Do, does it need to be a 50-50 ratio? No. The right poison, just one or two drops, and you're done. And this is how Satan works. This is, Satan did not approach the Jews of the Old Testament and say to them, hey, what if you forsake Yahweh... And, you know, you do this other thing over here. Instead, he came to them and said, yeah, 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 just keep, what, keep doing what you're doing. But um, have you thought about doing this too? And he added impurity to purity. He didn't say, quit doing all that good stuff you're doing. He didn't say, quit attending Silver Hills Church. He didn't say, quit serving and, and cutting the grass and, and quit, quit giving of your tithes and offerings. He, di he didn't say, quit reading your Bible Quit praying. No, he just said, well, why don't you try doing it this way? And just mix in a little bit of poison, a little bit of poison. It's called syncretism. When you take two things that don't belong together and you blend them together, and the Jews still felt like they had their worship, their pure worship. Only they didn't because they had blended in poison a cancerous form of worship that is detestable in the, in the eyes of God. We need to always be on guard as the church that we are not engaging in some form of syncretism where we're bringing the world into the church and allowing the world to have authority in the church. More on that later. The second point, so the first one was, does the relationship have the potential to erode your own commitment to godliness? The second one, does the relationship in any way cause you to support the work of those who are opposing, opposing truth, goodness, justice, essentially the word of God? Does the relationship cause you to support that work? For instance, most of the time I just ignore spam callers, you know, telemarketers that are like calling to try to scam you. Every once in a while, <laughs> I get a, you know, I don't know if it's that temper that I was talking about or what it is, but I will answer the phone. And I remember this one particular time I was on a military assignment and I'm staying in a hotel room with my buddy, whose name is also Ken. And uh, so we're in the hotel room together and this guy calls up saying he's from Microsoft. 
and he says that there's a problem with my computer and he needs me to get on my computer and give him some information so that he can help me debug something or whatever. And immediately I had the sense like, oh, I think this guy's, you know, I think this guy's a scammer. I don't think this is Microsoft. But I went along with it for a little while and my buddy was like, dude, it's a scam, just hang up. I'm like, oh, hold on. So I go along with him for a little while and he starts asking me questions that if he's Microsoft, he ought to already know this. You've called me. You have certain information about me and my computer, and yet you're asking me for information that I ought to be able to ask you for. And so we get to a certain point where he's, he's played his hand, right? I, I, it's, it's so obvious. And I just <laughs> laid into him and said, you are working for an evil company, you are employed by a satanic, wicked work. You have no business working for them. God will judge you for what you are doing. You need to quit your job and find a new one. And my buddy's over there sitting on the other bed, and he's like... <laughs> he's like, dude, I've never seen that side of you. And, and I'm probably giving you a JV version of, of how much I laid into that guy. Um, most of the time, I just ignore him. But there are jobs that you cannot have without compromising your integrity. And I couldn't begin to list them all. Um, a scammer, you know that in, in Russia, they literally have whole companies, corporations, that their job is to scam Americans. That is the, that is the business strategy, is they have tactic after tactic after tactic, over the phone, over email, you name it, they are trying to scam Americans. Entire corporations. And it's probably not just Russia, it's probably India as well and other places. What about somebody holding a sign? My first job was holding a sign for my mother's property management company. Holding a sign, this way to the condos, right? But what if the sign you're holding is, hey, we're in Nevada, hey, this way to the brothels. Did you have that job? No. Because by the very nature of that relationship, working for that boss, you're supporting those who are opposing all manner of goodness, justice, godliness. Can you work in Hollywood and keep your integrity? I think the right person could. But man, what an uphill battle. Maybe you're a videographer. Maybe you're an editor. Maybe you make sound effects or, or I don't know, stage props or something. And and you're working in Hollywood. That's tough. Man, that's tough. I do believe we need a lot of Christians in Hollywood. And so I'm, I'm not the guy who's going to say, don't go and work there. But I am the guy who's going to say, make sure that you are in a church. That you are committed to a community of the saints who will hold you accountable, who will watch your back, who will ask you the hard questions, right? And of course, I'm not anticipating any of you fleeing off to Hollywood to look for a job. But... The point, of course, is there are jobs that you cannot work without jeopardizing your integrity. Maybe I've been told that honest car salesmen are not typically very successful. I don't know if that's true. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but... There's also... This goes a bunch of directions, right? It's not just employment. In our relationships, in the way that we encourage other people, in the way that we vote. Let me just say this, because we're in, in the midst of our election season. It is possible to walk into a voting booth and sin. Politics is not automatically amoral meaning no matter what you do, God doesn't really feel any different about this side or that side. No. God is very clear about his commands, not only for individuals, but for nations, for counties, for states. It is very possible to walk into a voter booth and sin. Now, sin is absolutely forgivable, right? If you have committed a sin, casting a vote for someone who represents wickedness and wicked intentions with the power that they've been given by the state, by the county, by the nation. If you have voted for that person, yes, God will, of course, forgive that sin. 
if you afterwards come to realize I cast a vote for a person who is doing very wicked things, I made a mistake. I made an error in judgment. God, upon confession and a plea for forgiveness, upon humility, will absolutely forgive that. But if you pretend like you're free to vote however you want and God has no preferences, God has no concern over where you cast your vote, you're fooling yourself. Because there, is, there are those in society and in politics who are pursuing some amount of righteousness, and there are those who are pursuing everything that flies in the face and spits in the word of God. We are not allowed by God to cast a vote for those who are spitting in the face of God by doing the very things, the very agendas that are contrary to his word. And I'll just keep it at that. There may come a day where I'm even more blunt on that topic. But for now, I want to leave it to the Holy Spirit to help you see in the very near future how to vote. Number three, does the relationship damage your reputation? And that's a hard one, right? That's a hard one for very obvious reasons. How much time do you have? Okay. That's a hard one for very obvious rep- re- reasons because how subjective is that? Okay, don't, don't damage your reputation. You know what we saw in 2020 and 2021? Over and over and over, people saying, and I'm looking at my elders, you know, my, my fellow elders here, and, and we all know, and you, you don't have to be an elder to know this, there are Christians all over America saying, if you don't shut down your church like the government is telling you to, then you are damaging the reputation of your church. And there are others saying, if you shut down your church, you are damaging the reputation of your church. Right? You hear what I'm saying? Like, this reputation thing is messy. Us must come before God, humility, his guidance, and how to live our lives. We cannot be living constantly in fear of what others would say. I have an opinion on that front. Um, yes, I believe that the government overreached. Yes, I believe that the government had no right to tell the church because, tell you what, the government has the authority to do what God has told the government that they have the authority to do. And the, God has in nowhere, from cover to cover in this book, God has nowhere given the government authority over the church. The the government does have accountability over the church. If I were to do something outrageously foolish and it cost a bunch of you your lives, the government has the right to step in and say, this pastor, we believe, committed a crime of negligence and he failed to do his duty to protect the sheep. That is absolutely the government's role. But they have not been given the role to decide for you and I when this church will no longer meet and when we will meet. They've been given the role to advise. So, the next time the government says, church, for this reason, you need to shut down, we will weigh the evidence, we will listen to what's going on. For instance, if we were living in San Diego, and the government officials said, there's a, there's a, uh, what's it called, a big wave, Uh, there's a tsunami coming, and your church is right on the coast, and and it's coming Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. If you gather for worship, everyone who gathers will die. Okay, thank you for that information. The church has now decided we're not going to meet this week, right? (laughs) We are, although scripture has told us, do not forsake gathering together as is the habit of some. Hebrews chapter 10. The government's role is not to tell us what decision to make, but to advise us in the decision that we make. These are spheres of sovereignty that God has established. The state is responsible for certain things, The church is responsible for certain things, and fathers slash husbands in their home are responsible for certain things. And yes, there's some overlap of these circles, but they are separate circles. So the reason I bring that up is because it's incredibly relevant to our text. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. I've been pastoring throughout the whole pandemic, and... I'm not going to beat myself up over the decisions that I've made because all of us, all pastors across the nation have been doing our best. 
with situations that we have never been trained for, right? We have never heard about. We had no preparation to know what to do in this situation. And so I have so much grace. You know, Austin and I might have done totally different things. I love this dude. I mean, I am, I am constantly... <laughs> Pastor Ben and I may have made different decisions, right? It's okay. We might have had three very different approaches to how to roll with the punches of COVID. It's okay. My, my concern is that the church set a precedent for being unequally yoked with the government, where on, on the left side, you have the local church, and on the right side, you have governors, and you have other governmental leaders. You have... Anthony Fauci and, and many others. And they're pulling the plow of God's kingdom. This is not ever to be the case. We have, a, we have a work, and I've often told people the reason why there came a point where churches should no longer be shut down, the reason why, and I got a letter just recently from someone saying um, we should still be doing all this COVID stuff, and it was basically a rebuke to me uh, and to other pastors in the city saying, do what the government says, do what the government says, do what the government says. And I'm like, what is the government even telling us to do right now? I thought that was all kind of in the rearview mirror. I don't, <laughs> I don't even know, like, why would you send me this letter now? But here's the thing. Your government officials have not been commissioned by God to think through the implications of a church shutting down on the eternal souls of people who need the gathering together. They need the fellowship of the saints. That is not their responsibility to factor that in. When Congress meets, when governors talk to each other about policies to create, they cannot factor in the spiritual element of how much people need the gathering of the saints in making their decisions. So can they shut down a restaurant? I guess, sure. Can they shut down other things? I guess, sure. Can they shut down the church? Not according to God. They can advise, and we can respond. Okay, off that soapbox. Um, back to reputation. So I say all that just to say, I do believe that there is a potential that how we reacted to COVID could affect our, our reputation. However, I think that a whole lot of using that word reputation and how to make the decision about COVID has been manipulation. You should do what I think you should do Otherwise, you are damaging the reputation of Christ. What an arrogant thing to say. What an absolutely arrogant thing to say. There are individual circumstances in each church that are somewhat different from each other. Some churches are very, very young. Guess what? They can take more risks when it comes to something like COVID than churches that are a lot older. And my church in Kentucky was significantly older than this one. I was by far one of the youngest adults. So... You roll with the punches in different ways, and you pray and pray and pray with humility. Amen? Billy Graham, I've heard different reports about how bad it was, but Billy Graham was deeply criticized for doing evangelism at a bar when he was in seminary. I heard one report that he actually got kicked out of a Christian school for doing evangelism at a bar. I'm not sure if that's actually true. I haven't looked that up on, like, you know, one of those Mythbuster things. But <laughs> um, point is... There are times when your reputation um, just cannot be, you can't live in fear that someone is going to think that your reputation has been tarnished by doing the Lord's work. That being said, you and I do have a responsibility before the Lord and before the world to represent Christ well. And there are obviously times when the, the relationships that we have with others can damage our reputation. We just need to keep doing what I've been saying. Humble prayer. Now let me come to our second and third points, which we won't spend as much time on. Again, the first one, in every entanglement of life, we must remember that we have been set apart, made holy. And so, these are sub-points. Two and three are basically sub-points. The second point here, and these are also fill in the blanks if you like to do that, our call to holiness is crucial because of the work we are doing. This is among many other things, right? But it is crucial. Like, Paul used the metaphor of a yoke. He could have said, uh, do not be involved with unbelievers. 
do not be um, around unbelievers or do not be friends with unbelievers. He could have said a lot of different things, but he chose the word yoke, right? He chose that word under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And what is a yoke but a device for work? And here's the reality. When you link arms with someone who is on a different life trajectory from you, you will not work effectively side by side. Now, I, I would say, let's think of this on the church level, because at, on every level, every point I'm making is true on an individual level, you and me, and it's true on a church level, because you and I are called individually to holiness, and the church is called to holiness. But let's think about our Catholic friends, for instance. Maybe even Mormon, that would be a more extreme example, but let's, I don't know, let's say Catholic. Um, when it comes to life-saving work related to abortion, can we cooperate? Can we work together to try to effectively bring about a realization in our society that abortion is in fact murder, that there is life inside of the woman when she says, my body, my choice, she's failing to understand that what's in her body is not her body. It is another body inside of her body. Yes, we can work with Catholics. We can even work with Mormons on that, on that front, right? Okay, now change the scenario. Can we work beside them for evangelistic purposes? No. Because fundamentally, the, the goal that we are striving after, the path to eternal life, is categorically different. For us, it is faith alone, it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The Christ of the scriptures alone. And for others, there is some amount of works that are being built into that. There are some false promises that are being made. There are, I mean, purgatory and for Catholics and three levels of heaven for Mormons. And there's just all this other mess that does not fit with the Christian gospel. So no, we cannot cooperate in evangelism with certain parties that we could cooperate in a different way. The work that the church alone has been given it is the most amazing work in all the world. But you think about the privileged place that God has given us. That sinners as we are, not only would God forgive us, but then invite us into his mission to redeem the world. Think about the fact that, yes, it is important for you to go to work, work hard, do a good job. David was just telling us yesterday at the work, uh, work day about how he grew up and his, he was taught by his dad that, hey, don't ever let your boss see you doing nothing, right? Like, you, he, your boss might have given you 10 tasks to finish in an eight-hour shift, and you might finish it in four hours. Nowadays, what do kids do? Pull out the phone, start doing whatever, Right? And then in walks the boss. Yes, they got all the work done that he asked them to do, but now they're piddling away their time, still on the clock. And David was told very wisely by his father, by his father, don't let your boss see you doing nothing. If you finish all the tasks, sort nuts and bolts, or sweep the floor, or look for something to do. Now, that's a good, wise thing. I think you could probably find that in the Proverbs. I'll bet you I could. There's all kinds of proverbs about slothfulness versus hardworking, right? But man, think about the fact that you and I have been called to a work that is not beneficial just for a paycheck. It is not beneficial just for some reputation in this life. It's not beneficial just for a promotion. <sighs> Imagine with me arriving in glory. And somebody walks up to you and says, Norm, I don't know if you remember me, but when I was 12 years old, we had this little conversation at a family gathering. And you said this thing to me, and I just couldn't get it out of my head. And I walked away for days and just thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. And God used that to open my eyes to my need. Conversations like that will be frequent. They ought to be frequent and normal in heaven. 
There's a guy who wrote a song, and I did the song as a special music multiple times in multiple different churches, and apparently the guy went off the rails, which was heartbreaking. Uh, Ray Bolts' song, Thank You. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a light that would change. Thank you for giving to the Lord. You and I have been invited into a work. Like I, I had a boss one time. She said, oh, you want to be a pastor? That's cool, that's cool. The pay's not very good, the, but the retirement benefit. <laughs> <laughs> well, guess what? That's not just for me. Christian, that is for you. The retirement benefit of laboring for his kingdom. Man, aside from standing in Jesus' glory and seeing him face to face, there is nothing I desire more than to encounter people who would tell me that the labors of my mouth, of my prayers, of my mind, of my heart, the things that I did with my hands and my feet, the places that I went, the things that I said, that all of this actually mattered. Like in a way that will make a difference for eternity. Our work is crucial, and God has given the church this work. Point number three. Our calling to holiness is a call to be what you are. Would you join me in looking at 2 Corinthians 7, 1 again? Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. There is a call to be what you are. God has already made his children holy. He has set them apart. And yet he calls us to live as what we are. He calls us to says, bring holiness to completion. If you have been born again by the spirit of the living God, as we saw earlier, like that, that's not going to change. God will hold you. He will keep you. So that holiness of being set apart, that is irreversible. It is yours in Christ. So what does he mean by bringing it to completion? He means live that out. Be what you are. Do what you are. And he roots all this holiness talk back in verse 16. The second half of verse 16 where he says, for we are the temple of the living God. So I want to just, I want to break down the temple progression throughout the word of God really quick. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on this. We are almost done. But I want you to take a look at this progression of what we see in the word of God. Because the temple ultimately is a representation of God's presence on earth. There should be a slide for it. We'll see. Oh, it's frozen? Okay. Well, you, you, maybe you won't get to see it, but you can hear it. The story of the Word of God begins with a man and his wife in the garden. And God's presence is manifested there. It says that God walked with man in the cool of the day. It's God's presence here on earth. In what we could metaphorically sort of call a temple. That Eden was the original temple the place where God manifested his presence. Well, that temple fell, broken by sin. And many, many, many years passed. Like, we're talking the entire book of Genesis. That's a lot of years. And then, all of a sudden, God calls a man named Moses to set his people free from Egypt. And Moses leads the people out of Egypt and eventually establishes what is known as the tabernacle which would mature into the temple, which were almost identical-looking things. One was much more permanent, which was, one was much more temporary. So we have the tabernacle, and then we have Solomon's temple that was built by who? Solomon. Well, as I said earlier, that didn't go so well, because Israel rebelled and rebelled and rebelled and rebelled, and God sent Babylon, and they destroyed Solomon's temple. Utterly destroyed it. But, 
After 70 years in exile, God sent his people back. They rebuilt the temple. And now, once again, we have now what's called the Second Temple Era. And during this Second Temple Era, God sends his one and only son into the world. God taking on flesh. And now, if you thought that God's presence was in the Holy of Holies in the temple, man, Jesus is in the flesh walking among us. He is the temple of God. He is God's holy presence on earth now. Such that the temple was really no longer needed. And therefore, Jesus prophesied its destruction in amazing detail. I can't wait to to have a sermon someday where we look at Jesus' prophecy of the destruction of the temple. Because not like Nostradamus, not like uh, Rasputin or one of these guys. No, Jesus predicted with utter precision the events surrounding the destruction of the second temple. It's amazing. Like evidence that Jesus is God, or at least evidence that he is a prophet of God. It's amazing how accurate he was. I mean, shouldn't be because he's God, but... So the temple is destroyed in 70 A.D. That's not to worry. Is, well, do we have a temple with Jesus on, on earth? No, we don't. And we no longer have the temple building? No, we don't. Why is this not a problem? Because, church, we are the temple of the living God. God's presence on earth has not been lost. It is in you if you are in Christ. And God has always had very, very strict rules. Oh, sorry, to finish the story, as you see on the slides, the day will come when, there, when New Jerusalem will arrive, and there will be something new about God's presence on earth as, new, as heaven and earth collide into what it will be called in he- new heavens and new earth, new Jerusalem. It will be something like Eden, but not exactly. It will be better. But at every stage, at every phase of history, through every one of these steps, God has made it abundantly clear You do not enter my presence defiled. You do not enter my presence unholy, unclean. So, let's ask the obvious question. How on earth is God dwelling inside of you? You hear that question? God does not dwell with sin and wickedness. God does not dwell where it is unclean. How on earth is he dwelling in any one of us? Only by the finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus took on all of our filth in order to make us clean. We've we've been talking in recent weeks because Paul just gave us these beautiful words. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. Part of righteousness is the fulfillment of God's expectation of cleanliness. I remember one time I was talking to a girl that I worked with, and she had been sleeping around, like, a lot. And she contracted an STD, like a permanent one. And she just, she just was tears just streaming down. She's I feel so dirty, I feel so dirty. Yeah, I mean, that's the heartbreaking reality of what sin does. Sin is dirty. And of course, I tried to offer her as much hope in Christ as I could. But that is what sin does to us. And so in and of ourselves, man, there's no way that you could be the temple of the living God. You'd never be clean enough. But through the work of Christ, he has pronounced you clean. So be what you are. Be clean. Walk in cleanliness. Turn from sin at every chance you get. And when you fail, because you will, run back to his arms, confess your sins afresh and anew, and ask for his forgiveness once again. Perhaps you are here, as, we, as you turn to return to worship, and you might be thinking, okay, what do I do with all of this? I, I hope it's become clear 
that if you're here and you have not surrendered your life to Christ, if you're, if you're here and you have not clarified that relationship, right? You haven't had a de- DTR, a define the relationship, as kids used to say when I was in school. Um, maybe you haven't had a come to Jesus moment where you've really figured out where are we at, God? I would plead with you to be real with him. To ask him for clarity as to where you stand in his eyes. And if there is unconfessed sin, that you would confess it now. And bring it also to someone you trust so that you can have help in the journey from someone else who is seeking to follow Christ. And perhaps you've already been following Christ for some time. How are you to respond? Well, there's probably a lot of ways in which each of us need to wrestle with this calling to not be unequally yoked. To wrestle with this calling of of holiness. And it's a constant wrestle in my house as we think about our Netflix, our Disney Plus, the, the subscriptions that we have where, yes, I totally understand why others have canceled those subscriptions because there's wicked things going on on those platforms. There's also other things going on on those platforms that are helpful. And so I'm not going to take my conviction and automatically import it onto somebody else and say, well, your conviction in your home ought to mirror exactly my conviction in my home. But, I mean, these are, this is, this is so immensely practical. We all need to be wrestling with real things like this, right? How do we handle interactions with the world? May God give us wisdom. Heavenly Father, we long to be your holy people. We long to live life according to your prescripts, according to your calling, according to the holiness. You you said, be holy as I am holy. And God, in this life, I know that I am never going to attain to the standard. I'm never going to reach that standard of holiness in perfection. But God, I also know that it is always possible for me to grow in holiness, to be more and more consistent, to be more and more obedient. So this is my prayer for everyone who can hear my voice, Lord, that we would be growing in holiness, that the challenges to the gospel, the poison and the cancer that wants to creep in and corrupt our worship individually and together as a church, that you would open our eyes, God, and help us to see the cancer and help us to sniff out the poison so that we might turn away from it and offer you a holy form of worship that is unadulterated by sin. God, give us strength of will, the strength that is outside of ourselves in order to honor you more and more each day. I pray this all in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our hope, our Redeemer. Amen. Let's stand to our feet and praise God.
worship the God who knows the end from the beginning. And that includes all of human history, and that includes your life as well. So praise be to him who is working all things out according to the counsel of his plan of infinite wisdom, and we can have great joy that he is doing this. For all who are in him, he is working on our behalf because all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Um, I just want to remind our elders, we're going to have a really quick conversation before we jet out of here today. And uh, please be in prayer, just in general, for the elders of the church as we seek to always honor the Lord with the decisions that we make. Sometimes small decisions, sometimes big decisions, sometimes related to money, sometimes related to the discipleship of people, sometimes going after a sheep that is wandering away from the flock. All manner of things that that God has entrusted to his under-shepherds because he is the ultimate shepherd. Amen? All right, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your goodness, your faithfulness, your justice, your kindness. God, thank you for inviting sinners into your presence and then making us clean so that we can stand in your presence without being consumed by the raging fire that is our God. God, please be with each person as they go from this place. Continue to manifest your presence in ways that purify us, in ways that call us out of ourselves and into you. And um, Lord, help us to always be growing and growing and growing to be the people that you have called us to be. I thank you for your patience, your love, your kindness toward us individually and toward Silver Hills and toward the whites over here and their church, Calvary Baptist. Lord, would you bless their church? Would you bless their Bless Austin as he proclaims the gospel, as he admonishes the people, as he applies the word, as he seeks your counsel and your guidance to lead well. God, would you anoint him for all the work that he has been called to and, uh, and other leaders in his church with him. Lord, would you bless that church to grow and grow and grow deeper and wider, Lord, as we desire to see Silver Hills grow deeper and wider. I thank you, Lord, for our sister churches all across this city that are proclaiming your gospel this morning. And Lord, we ask for your blessings on all those who are being faithful with your gospel and that you would shut the mouths of the lions who are speaking against the gospel. We pray all this, Lord, for your glory and for our joy. In the name of Jesus Christ. Right. We need to make that up. Yeah.